Hello, everyone, and welcome to Visual Storytelling, Unleashing Your Creativity with the Brain. My name is Shelley Hayduck, and I'm co-hosting today's event with Matt Caton, our Director of Customer Solutions. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're really excited about today's webinar because we get to really express some of our creative interests in the brain, not just file management, project management, checklists and, and uh, document management. We're really, really going to be talking about how we use the brain for some of our own personal interests. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to talk about how the brain can be used for what I like to call idea incubation and in spurring that creative process for writing and for other projects. And whether you're trying to write your next uh, big novel or maybe just your company brochure or even just your resume, um, you can use the brain to really help you get over some of these um, bumps and hurdles. So I'm going to go ahead and open my writer's brain. I'm just going to go to the top of this brain. Now this brain is actually uh, a public brain. Happy to share it with all of you. And uh, this brain is, is a resource that I actually do share with certain writers and it's available on the cloud. Um, the whole idea and premise behind the brain is to visually uh, provide you with the context you need to have a more intelligent access to any information source. So um, in terms of your writer's brain, um, this particular brain, whether it be for writing or maybe you're producing a movie or maybe you're just um, uh, organizing a company event, is you can aggregate all your key resources in one place so um, when you actually need them, they're very accessible. So let me just review the structure of this brain. And this particular brain, uh, you'll notice I have some interesting wallpaper too, especially for creative brains. I always recommend you go ahead and, and put some wallpaper that really gets your creative juices flowing. Um, so I've got different things like um, write resources. So as a writer, there's various resources. Um, the Writers Guild of America, the Writing Center, um, just, to, just different conferences for networking and screenwriters and I've even got a section here on grammar as well how to look up different things there's an urban dictionary and each thought in the brain can be connected to any type of digital content whether that be on your computer or in the in, on the internet so for instance you can go to blue pencil editing now one of the nice things about this is it's always available to me and if I want to connect this to something else if maybe there's a particular uh, article or story writing by Stephen King this might be related to um, a, a story I'm working on called The Blue Rose. I can go ahead and make that connection. So uh, now when I am working on my particular fiction story called The Blue Rose, I can connect it to not only Edgar Allan Poe, but uh, some interesting resources on Amazon about Stephen King. And so that takes me into my fiction section, which is part of my writing projects. So uh, in addition to resources, um, you can go ahead and have all your different projects. In this particular brain, I've got a wide variety of projects. And then just talking about inf inspirational warehousing um, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, kickstart that creative process. So I have a thought called I am inspired by. And so this is where um, I was talking about just different authors. And for instance, I have a zoomable icon, an image of Franz Kafka, Mary Shelley, and then I clicked on Robert Frost. And one of the nice things about the brain now that we're back on Robert Frost is that you can have one piece of information effectively located under multiple categories. So I've got I am inspired by and then poetry and under two, type, uh, two different thoughts. And then this is the notes area that I was talking about below. So in this area, this is where we, I have the quote, poetry is a way of taking life by the throat. I actually mapped out the poem as child thoughts in the brain, the road not taken. So we've got two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference. So just a kind of cool little thing. I mean, I wouldn't do this for every poem, but, you know, you can do fun things. This is visualization software, so if you have a quote that you want to put in there um, and kind of navigate through some, some cool ideas, you know, that, that, that does it for me. You've got to kind of look at what's going to get you going. And the thing is, I wasn't writing poetry at the time. Then I came back and I had 
some different things I had to do. So you have these these areas of of inspirational adrenaline, if you will, ready to go, so that when you do get that next assignment uh, blog article, or you ha you're up at 2 a.m. and you've got to finish that corporate brochure, you can go through your brain and just get into the zone in terms of, of working on these different things. Um, one final area I do also want to show you is um, you can do conceptual frameworks. Um, we, a lot of people use the brain for project management. So uh, in that sense, you can map out different phases. I've sort of done the same thing with elements of story for writing. So we've got characters here, just different characters. In this case, we've got you know heroines, just different uh, you know from Disney characters to different movie heroines that I thought were kind of interesting. And again, I'm just using that zoomable icon feature that's really great um, and I'll show you how to do that really quickly. Let me actually go up to options and search web. Search web for Joan of Arc here and I'll just go to images. So all I have to do is I can copy an image here. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit copy and then I can come back to that particular thought and paste as a thought icon in this case and there we go and so I've got that image attached very nicely now you can also do the same thing with uh, screen grabs so this is a particular section in, in conflict uh, uh, and if I want to go ahead and uh, talk about human versus human nature I can if, if there's a particular image let's go ahead and grab maybe lo load this image maybe I just want to get uh, the face portion I can actually go ahead here and right click and select to capture thought icon and then I get I get these wonderful crosshairs and let's say I just want to get her face I can go ahead and crop that and then I've got that there and that works really well for screen grabbing for those of you that are in product development or uh, user interface design things like that and I've got that right there in my brain um, so that that takes us to elements of story and one of the things that I've, I've done in this particular brain for you, those of you that are nonfiction writers, is I mapped out Joseph Campbell, who remember he was in my in, inspirations. Um, what he's done is his, he's broken down the heroic journey. This is a particular theory of fiction writing that talks about all the phases of the hero's journey. Um, sometimes it's presented as a circle, sometimes in a linear object, but rather than just having a static diagram of this um, for the purpose of writing nonfiction, I actually have thoughts for each phase of that hero's journey. So, um, and in fact, uh, the hero's journey is something I've got linked to George Lucas because George Lucas was very much inspired by um, Joseph Campbell in all of his Star Wars um, stories as well. So um, there's 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 several phases. So if anyone is just getting into fiction and you know, kind of wants to check each box, it goes from the or the hero starts from the ordinary world to the call to adventure, all the way to the ordeal and the reward and then then the return with the elixir. So there's there's different things there, um, and you can actually go ahead and each phase um, map out what is going to work for each area of your story. So for instance here, meeting the mentor, I've got key characters um, for my story in this particular brain and this is some character development I was doing for that Blue Rose story. Let me connect that back to Blue Rose here and see. Of course I can make as many connections as I want and really that is what is creativity but the ability to connect two unusual ideas together um, to give you sort of that aha moment. So of course the brain being all about visual linkages is great for that. So here my three documents on my key characters for Blue Rose and my reference character is uh, from a Leo Tol Tolstoy novel as well. So I've got a link to her and that's the mentor of this particular story. Now you'll notice in addition to just web pages and and images, you can you know get down to business in the brain. You'll notice I've got the number three here by this particular Word document. So um, this is actually um, showing me that I've got three versions of a particular document. I love doing versioning in my brain because um, I can take notes on what each version offers. Um, so I'm thinking of uh, uh, you know delving into 
thinking about a character that represents wisdom. So then I've got different versions and I can launch these versions in my brain and I can actually go ahead and if I save this, so it's version 3, um, the brain just saves back into a thought folder. So I can just go to save as and just go ahead and that's the current folder. That's just It's just a um, enumerated thought folder and I want if I want to save this as a version 4 now I can just change the version and hit save and hit OK and now you can see if I go back to my brain here I've got four versions of that document and there is version 4 right there so it's very easy now if I want to go ahead and create a new uh, story or a new project that's really easy as well actually let me go back to my writing projects and let's go ahead and create a company brochure. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a new thought called my company brochure. And with my company brochure, I can go ahead and add a document. I'm just going to add an attachment here. And that'll be a Word document. So, And that's going to launch right from the brain. So now you can see I've got that thought. And I've got my company brochure. Let me just go ahead and close some of these documents here. And there's my company brochure. And I can start typing all the things about my company. And go ahead and save that in my brain. And then from there, I can go ahead and also reference uh, other articles. Um, you know, if I want to go ahead and, for instance, let's say I'm working on something for thebrain.com and I'm maybe writing about our cloud services. So I want to go to the cloud services page and maybe add that in. So I'm going to put that in my company brochure. So I want to reference that. So I'm going to drag and drop this URL from the browser address window into the brain. So now I've got that link there. So as I'm thinking about my company brochure, I have to think, oh, I want to you know, talk about cloud services. Um, so that's the great thing. And I can do the same thing for other projects. Um, so for instance, the Blue Rose, um, we actually did setting in Savannah, Georgia. So I have all kinds of links to the different trees in Savannah, Georgia, ghost tours, I can launch that site, and just the beauty of the city. So uh, what I could do is I can continue research in this brain and grow this area. So let me just go ahead and search for Savannah uh, trees. Now for this particular story, I might use the tree as a symbol. So these are just live oak trees and Spanish moss. Wow, that Spanish moss is just beautiful. It makes for a great story setting. So let me go ahead and drag and drop that. And I was kind of wondering what that the name was for that stuff. So I'm actually going to create a new section here called Spanish Moss and continue to research that. Um, so then, of course, I can go up to Options and Search Web. And now I'm just doing research for my story. So here's something on the... Uh, Wikipedia, look at all these beautiful images. Let's go ahead and actually grab an image here. I'm going to copy this image and paste this right here as a thought icon. And now I can kind of just look at that, and that, that really sets the tone for this particular story, which is uh, symbolic of life, but a little om ominous. Um, so that I'm going to actually uh, reference as in my brain. I'm going to call this literary symbols of the story. So uh, I can go ahead and hear my literary symbols are actually, of course, the haunted stairs. So I'm going to move haunted stairs under there. And I'm going to go ahead and link Spanish moss. So in this story, the uh, environment or the setting takes on some symbolism. And I want to be conscious of that as I'm writing it. So you can see how kind of analyzing things. And I actually don't want and that under setting. That was a mistake. So I actually want to move literary symbols up under the story so it's right at the top. So you can see how I'm kind of crafting ideas in the brain as, I'm, as, I'm, as they occur. And of course, I can add an icon as well. We've got built-in icons. So I'm actually going to go to our, the category of symbols. And just go ahead and my for my literary th symbols 
thought, put a little icon there. So now I've got my literary symbols. And I like that section so much, I'm going to create a pin to there. So now, regardless of where I am, if I'm working on other short stories, um, new stories, um, I can go ahead and go back to that literary symbol thought. Um, I've also got uh, pins to other areas I frequent. For instance, the Writers Guild of America. I've got a link to that. And of course, I can just go ahead and launch that web page really easily. Um, or I can go to that Hero Art Journey, that section um, that is, I've, I've carved out with Joseph Campbell, or my elements of story. And this is another section where we've got everything from character, climate, to plot, to setting, to symbolism. And actually, there's a section here where I need to go ahead and then add literary symbols. And I can decide, is, is this uh, symbolism section, is this getting redundant with symbolism? Maybe what I want to do is I actually want to link this right up to elements of story, unlink it from symbolism. And I don't need, they need this connection anymore because that, that, and I'm going to un get, actually delete, forget symbolism. So now instead of symbolism, I have literary symbols in this area. So you can see how your, your brain can change as you use it. And the other thing about the brain is you can sync it across different devices. Um, for those of you that want to see this particular brain, it is available and is published online. So let me just go to the online and view this brain in my web browser. So this is the same brain that we just uh, looked at online in my cloud. And uh, I don't actually, let me see, how, let me go ahead and uh, sync this brain so that you can see any changes that were just done. And those, those may or may not come through because again, I'm dealing, unfortunately, I'm working remote today and I have a bit of a slow connection as you guys noticed. But anyway, this is all through the cloud. So I can look at this brain online. I could look at it on my iPhone, on my iPad. I can share it with people. Let me go into settings here. And you can see I've got Brigitte as a reader and I've got Matt and a couple other people as editors so they can go in and change it. So actually Matt can come in as part of his team, my team, and, and change that. And in this case, this is a little bit unusual. Usually if it's a team brain, you'd make it, keep it private, which would be the default. But in this case, I have made this brain public because I'm a member of a few different writing writers groups and people do like to reference this. So if any of you want the link to this brain um, or even the sample brain, we're more than happy to send this to you. And of course, this is just part of my account in the brain. And uh, so if I want to go back, I can just go ahead and, and save this stuff. There's nothing new here. Um, you can actually see it has updated that section on literary symbols that I created on my, my desktop here is actually now available on the cloud. And let's say Spanish Moss, maybe I want to send this section on Spanish Moss, moss to Matt because Matt's all about gardening and all kinds of things. I'm just going to right click on this. On, again, I'm on my online brain and hit share and I've got a link that I can tweet out. I can also embed this into a website. So this is also a great way to, to share things or maybe, you know, one of you is, is really into Joseph Campbell and the elements of story or you like Joseph Campbell because he's sort of um, helped inspire Star Wars. So I'm going to go ahead again and, and right click and hit share and I'm just going to share this link out and then the recipient of this link depending on whether your brain is public or private, if it's private sharing, they'll have to be a team brain member. If it's public sharing, you can just uh, click on this link and it will go directly to this area. And I think with that, that sort of gives you a good overview. Um, I want to pass presenter to Matt because Matt also has a public brain that people, uh, that is quite prop popular and it has to do with, with Shakespeare. That's right. So I look forward to sharing my brain here uh, with you. And my brain is, is a little bit different, the brain that I'll be sharing. Uh, while Shelley is uh, busy writing the next great American novel and using the brain to research her characters and elements of her you story mean Canadian and novel. symbolism and uh, the next great Canadian novel. Sure. I'm just international, kidding. <laughs> international bestseller. Yeah. I am using the brain to focus on one of my hobbies, one of my personal interests, and that is William Shakespeare. So this particular brain is all about William Shakespeare. This particular brain, again, all about Shakespeare. So let me take you on a little bit of a tour 
first and foremost, sort of the heart and soul of this brain is the literature of Shakespeare. So this brain contains the complete works of Shakespeare. Every word Shakespeare is known or attributed to uh, to have written is here in my brain. And that makes for a very, very powerful tool uh, for this environment because I can do a search on any content, a particular word, a phrase, um, anything I'd like, and find exactly what I'm looking for. Um, so let me first take you through the different areas. Obviously, I've categorized them into some very popular areas, the history plays, uh, the tragedies of Shakespeare, comedies, and sonnets. One sonnet in particular I actually keep pinned at the top of my brain. It's sonnet number 122. And I know this sonnet by heart. I've got a few different sonnets and, and different areas of, of Shakespeare memorized, but this one in particular, thy gifts, thy tables are within my brain, full charactered with lasting memory. And it just goes to show that uh, Shakespeare was a true visionary. What it means, if you break it down line by line, is all the information, everything you've ever given me, uh, the knowledge and information are within my brain. In this case, we're talking about our digital brain software, full character, meaning fully explained with lasting memory, archived. So I never lose any information as long as it's going into my brain. Thank you, William Shakespeare. And as you can see, once again, all of the individual sonnets, let me just rearrange my real estate here. Um, in this case, I have the actual sonnets themselves printed out down below in the notes section of the brain. So I can click on any one of those sonnets, go right down into the notes, and, uh, and read through the sonnets. Now, for the stories, such as we'll take comedy, for example, and uh, again, let me just give this a little bit of real estate. Obviously, let's take A Midsummer Night's Dream, a very well-known comedy by Shakespeare. The notes section for all of his, his plays um, the notes section I use as just a quick synopsis, uh, sort of the cliff notes, if you will, of the play. If I'm, my wife and I are going out to uh, you know, the Summer Shakespeare Festival, we're going to see a play we haven't seen in a long time or never seen before, and I sort of want to just know the background, so I go in with a little bit of knowledge about that particular play, I'm going to read through the synopsis in my brain, uh, just a quick summary of the play. But if I want the full script, I simply click on the attachment for each individual thought, and I keep these very simple as as plain text, uh, which many, um, you know, it, it, that's how the Shakespeare would look in a book, line by line, lines are numbered, etc. So um, this is fantastic. I can read through the entire play here if I want to do that as well, and uh, search on all of that content. But my brain goes beyond that. I'm not just interested in um, the plays of Shakespeare and the sonnets of Shakespeare. It's also really fun and interesting for me to know more about um, what was going on in Shakespeare's life when he wrote this play. What are some of the movies that uh, have been inspired by Shakespearean plays, etc. And that is all here in my brain as well. So you can see A Midsummer Night's Dream. I've got some character synopsis down below. I've actually been in this play before. Uh, it is truly one of my favorites. So I keep some additional information about the characters, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream movie, and notice that I have a link to a very obscure 1991 movie called L.A. Story. You might not have ever heard of it or remember it. It starred Steve Martin and Sarah Jessica Parker, very young Sarah Jessica Parker at the time, and a comedy about living in Los Angeles, and it is very loosely based, not so loosely, I don't think, on A Midsummer Night's Dream. Some of the same things that happen and in, in, in uh, interviews by Steve Martin, he's even mentioned that was the inspiration for L.A. Story, was A Midsummer Night's Dream. Young lovers lost in the woods, in this case, lost in Los Angeles. So um, I keep references to different similar movies, etc. And taking it back to just William Shakespeare himself, I have mapped out in sort of my own research that I've done sort of the different um, phases of Shakespeare's life, the years 
that he was writing who he was working for at the time, Lord Chamberlain's men, uh, was he working at the Globe, uh, was it the final years, the early years, etc. And it really, really helps you better understand what was going on. And a great example of that is if I go over to, I'll jump out of resources and go right back to literature and into uh, comedy and The Tempest. Now, some people read The Tempest and they think, okay, it's a tragedy sort of comedy. It, it actually falls under comedy that happens out at sea. But it truly, if you look a little bit deeper, is Shakespeare saying goodbye to the stage. It's what is believed to be his final work, so it falls under the category of uh, 1611 to his retirement, um, and he, he died in 1616, so it was one of his final plays that he ever wrote. Is he saying goodbye to the stage? Is he saying goodbye to the world? It kind of gives me goosebumps every time I read The Tempest, and I have this additional knowledge about that particular play, just saved in my, my general research. And of course, once again, let's point out some uh, one of the fun features. I have uh, The Tempest linked to that old 1956 uh, movie for, Forbidden Planet. If you remember Warning Will Robinson that, that became a TV show, I, I believe. I think it started as a movie, became a TV show. Once again, based not so loosely on the adventures of The Tempest. Some of the characters translate perfectly into The Forbidden Planet. So I have that link being displayed there over to my movie links as well. So other areas of this particular brain um, if I jump out of literature, I can come into games. Games are just some fun things that I play with my kids and uh, with some of my other actor friends that are uh, writer friends that are also interested in Shakespeare, so I have an area for that. But also resources, and there's a lot going on in my resources area. Um, fun things as well as very important things. Fun being the Shakespearean insult generator. Shakespeare had a very, very fun way, an interesting way of insulting people um, on stage and making it sound very intelligent and eloquent. So you can actually open up a couple of different web pages and um, find out measure for measure, no word to save thee. I have nothing to say to you. That's like saying talk to the hand in Shakespearean language. Um, so it just generates random fun uh, sort of insults. And if you don't understand what it means, what it says, if you're reading through a uh, Shakespearean play, I have set up, and this is just my own creation uh, that I've put together over the years of, of studying and reading Shakespeare, uh, my own Shakespearean dictionary. Now, a lot of this I just listed in pieces, but I also add from time to time uh, my own phrases that I have to go through and look up, and I, I don't see it right away. Um, on the web, I've got to do a little bit of research, and I typically in this area, I'll just find, um, I'll just click on a letter H and scroll down. Let's say we're reading through a particular play, and um, I come to, well, I know what a hatch is, uh, but a uh, haunch, what is a haunch? A haunch means in the rear or the later end. Um, I would, if, if out of context, a haunch, I might think that's like a hunch. Uh, like an idea? No, not at all. It means uh, that this come came at a later at a later date. So if they're talking about a story, when did you find out this information? Uh, it came to me in a haunch. That means it it came to me later. It it took a little while, but towards the end of my research, I found out what this meant, etc. So I use uh, this area quite a bit, and I can just do a quick search. Like uh, for example, uh, Hyde Fox and all after. I'll just type that into my search. Hide Fox and all after. So uh, it's telling me right away that my, the brain search, uh, there's no thought called Hide Fox and all after, but these words appear in over 31 different pages of content. Uh, but I can put that into quotes and find that, whoops, I got my cursor out of there. I can put this into quotes and find and all after. I'll do a search. Appears there in my dictionary. And this is a phrase, Hyde Fox and all after uh, in scene three of Hamlet. And I can go directly to my 
Hamlet thought. So not only can I find out what that word means, if I'm looking that up, I see that written in some other literature somewhere. Shakespeare used it as well. That person probably lifted it off of Shakespeare. I can even find where that is actually written because of the full indexing of Shakespearean's complete plays. I can go and hone right in on that particular phrase. So I really, really love uh, my dictionary that I've built and I add to this um, quite often when I'm reading through every single play, every time I'm reading through the play, I'm always finding and discovering new information and adding to this, uh, that information here to this particular brain. So, um, you know, some people from time to time say, well, Shakespearean plays, they're all out there. It's, it's finite. You build the brain, you're done. You've got all the information on Shakespearean plays. But there's more information to be learned uh, for, for me in particular. I don't claim ever to know it all. So this is a, a learning experience, and it's a passion and a hobby uh, that I have. So I really, really enjoy continuing to grow and evolve this particular brain. But I've also put in uh, parts of instructional areas into the brain uh, that I know very well, but sometimes I refer back to it and I, I hear back from other people because I do share this brain online, uh, that it has helped them to better understand what iambic pentameter is and how what a feminine ending is. And you can see the dum da dum da dum da dum da dum etc. So there's a, a way, a pattern that Shakespeare would write his both prose and poetry etc. Some of it using iambic pentameter. And so I've got just more information about uh, his language and how he spoke, etc. And then finally, I also have an area called related authors. So um, as I continue to know more about Shakespeare, I realize, you know, Shakespeare was influenced by other people. Not only has Shakespeare influenced other people, but he was influenced by others as well. So I'm starting to look into some of that information, and, and lately I've been spending some time on Thomas Middleton. So Thomas Middleton wrote plays around the same time as Shakespeare, and recently I've come across a couple of articles that suggest that Thomas Middleton actually wrote Macbeth. Um, I can say that out loud. I'm not on a stage. Those of you know that, that know Macbeth know when you're in a theater, you're not actually allowed to say Macbeth. It's a superstition that bad things would happen. So here I've got all my information about Macbeth, the play, the synopsis, uh, the different movies that have been done uh, on Macbeth, etc. But I also have a link now under Thomas Middleton. And what I want to do is focus a little bit on a feature of the brain that comes in handy from time to time called directional links. Now first let me just click on the bloody blanket. Notice that this thought falls under Thomas Middleton. It also falls under Thomas Decker. So they co-wrote this particular play. Now I could just easily click and drag a link to connect these two thoughts. But I took that one step further. I actually can highlight a link. As you can see, you can click on a link to add attributes to individual links within the brain. So you're actually defining the relationship between two thoughts. So Thomas Decker, he's a co-author of Bloody Banquet. If he wrote specific parts of the Bloody Banquet or contributed it in a very certain way, um, I don't know much about this yet, but I can research it. And as I find out and I want to talk about, you know, he was paid 25% of the profits that Thomas Middleton was because he was lesser known. I might write about that in the notes. So I'm not sure if that's a fact or not, but I just want to share with you how I would add this information. So with the link highlighted, not a thought, but a link being highlighted by simply clicking on it, I can go down to the notes and Decker was paid 25 uh, percent of the profits from the so whatever was paid for this particular uh, novel by sometimes theaters would pay artists sometimes it was um, you know the king or nobility that would uh, that would request a script but regardless, I find out this great information. It's not necessarily just about the Buddy Banquet. It's not necessarily just about Thomas Banker, uh, uh, Thomas Decker. It's about the link between the two. 
So therefore, I've added that information to the link. And that really comes in handy from time to time. I like to leave information about the relationship between two thoughts, particularly in business. How does person A know person B? Uh, or what is their relationship to this company? It's not information about the company or the person. It's about the, the relationship between the two. So I put that information on the link. And even notice when I have a link, I still have this link co-author between Thomas Decker and the Bloody Banquet highlighted. The Thoughts tool tab, where you would typically see file attachments and information about content on a thought, the Thought tool tab has been changed to link. If I click away, now I'm looking at the Thought tool tab for the Bloody Banquet. I don't have any content down there yet, no notes on the Bloody Banquet thought, but if I click on the link between the two, now I've got the information about the link, the notes and the link attachments as well. So you can attach documents and files to links. I'm going to take that one step further. I'm going to click on the link between Thomas Middleton and Macbeth. And the first thing that I want to do, I've clicked on the link. I want to highlight that. So I'm going to click on the color wheel and make that stand out as red. So it just really stands out, a nice bold color. And I'm actually going to change this into what we call a directional link, a one-way link. Because when I'm on the Thomas Middleton thought, I want to know that he is suspected, and I've got a few articles over here on the, on the subject, he's suspected of possibly writing Macbeth. Or maybe Macbeth was, um, you know, Shakespeare was lifting and stealing characters and ideas. That's another theory as well. But regardless, I want to know about that when I'm on the Thomas Middleton thought. I don't really need to know that when I'm on the Macbeth thought. When I'm on Macbeth, I want to talk about the characters and other movies it's linked to, etc. Maybe linked to Shakespeare, yes, but Thomas Middleton, he hasn't earned the title of author yet, so therefore I only want to see this link appear from the Thomas Middleton thought. So with this link highlighted, I go down to the link tool tab down below, and I can first click on the little circle that you can see to make a directional link. That's just a visual that I can add to any thought. This person reports to this person or a thought process, a business process flows in this direction. So I can add arrows to thoughts. That's just a nice visual. But when I check on the box, now I've made it a one-way thought. So I'm only going to see Thomas Middleton linked to Macbeth when I come in from the Thomas Middleton thought. And here's where I can add the thought label as well. Uh, possible author. So, Thomas Middleton, possible author, as you can see, of Macbeth. So when I come into related authors, yes, I will see that information. However, when I go over to my literature, and Macbeth, if you know, is a tragedy, so I'll click on Macbeth, notice that the link is not being visualized. It's a one-way link. It only appears from one direction coming in from Thomas Middleton. So those are the one-way links that you can set up within the brain. We don't use them. I don't use them, I should say, too often. Typically, I want to go to a thought from either direction and just display the link. But from time to time, it really becomes a valuable tool to say, all right, this information is only needed when I'm coming in from, from thought A rather than from thought X or whatever the case may be. So those are another feature that you can set up within the brains you create, those one-way links. And again, just to show you that thought is still there, that link is still there, I'm going to just use my past thought list down below and go right to Thomas Middleton, and there it is, possible author of Macbeth. So another feature within the application that really helps you to define the relationship and better understand um, how all of your thoughts are connected to one another. I did have one other example that I want to share with you before we jump into question and answer. I will point out also that this particular brain that I've uh, created for Shakespeare is publicly accessible. There's links on our website and everyone attending today will get a thank you email with a link taking you directly to this brain that you can navigate through online. So obviously I don't have all the content in certain areas as far as related authors. That's something that I'm building now. And it's also, I'd like to point out, it's my own personal opinion. Uh, some people might see a possible link between uh, 
uh, Macbeth, one of their favorite Shakespearean plays, and Thomas Middleton. That's a tragedy to think that's even possible. So again, it's my opinion and my dictionary that I've created and, and ideas about Shakespeare. So keep that in mind for all those Shakespeare uh, enthusiasts out there. Uh, but also another sample brain that I wanted to share with you is my children's books brain. Um, so this particular brain is where I keep track of some children's books that for fun my wife and I have, have written together and ideas that I'm actually collecting with my kids about children's books. Um, so this is simply where I keep track of resources for me for writing um, is sometimes I just simply need to stare at the alphabet. It's that simple. I'm trying to uh, get through some writer's block. Maybe I need to find words that start with a, uh, a common letter or something like that or, or rhyming and I've got the rhyme zone so I can actually launch this web page, type in a word and find a word that rhymes with uh, Shakespeare or Helmet or whatever the case may be. So a lot of different resources that I refer to from time to time when I am writing. I keep my current books, so these are books that I have written, I'll get to those in a second, as well as book ideas. Uh, my kids and I recently caught a, a thought of an idea for a new book to write together about dinosaurs not actually going extinct, they actually just simply got very, very good at hiding. I thought it was a brilliant idea and of course it goes into my notes, into my brain. I would not remember that a month from now, a year from now, what have you. So anytime new ideas come in, titles or just subject matter about ideas, random thoughts as you can see, and this goes on and on. I've got pages of different random thoughts down there below, but I just drop it into my brain so I can remember that and get back to it later. Uh, but for current books, I'll just don't jump over really quickly uh, a fun little book that I first wrote years and years ago, and here's the full script of my book, uh, Peanut Butter Betty Bumblebee, so about a bee that doesn't know how to make honey, but she can make really great peanut butter. It's a fun little story, and uh, my wife and I decided a few years ago to actually try sending it out, so we've made some mailing lists. And I'm keeping track of all the different publishers and mailing lists that I send out. So here are different publishers that I really like that I think might be interested in some of the books that I've written or that we've written together. And I keep track of my mailing list. So here you can see my 2013. Uh, that was early on. I didn't send it to many people then. But if I go to uh, my 2016 mailing list, uh, there are the two different books that I wrote and uh, or mailed out. And here is the ongoing list down below. You can see I've got a couple of pages of the different publishers that I sent it to. Um, so once again, just managing the mailing list. I never want to send it to the same person twice. Um, just sort of getting it out there. And who knows? Maybe nothing will ever become of this. I've never had any books published. But this is just a fun way for me to manage uh, the, the books as well as feed my creativity and we write new books together we have fun reading them together so if that's the most that ever comes of it then great uh, but I keep track of all that information whether it's the creative aspect or the business aspect of it right here in my brain so this is a private brain that I don't share with others just because I've got all of my scripts and books and everything in it and uh, that just shows you a little bit of the diversity brains that I publicly share with others and I'm happy to hear feedback on and let others wander through my brain and brains where I've got some proprietary information and I don't mind sharing some titles and ideas with you but the actual scripts and books themselves I don't click on those thoughts uh, to to share those with others so this is a private brain I sync this to the cloud I know I've got online access but only I have online access um, as Shelly showed you earlier um, and I can actually open up my uh, log into my account. I have uh, brains that uh, that I access and are accessible to others and publicly accessible. Other brains are kept completely private. So it's secure, it's password protected, and I'm the only one that can access that particular brain online. And so I think with that, I've covered all of the features that I wanted to share with you today. Hopefully you've got some creative ideas and you can uh, get started creating your own creative brain. And with that, Patrick, how have the questions have uh, been going and any additional questions that would uh, need an answer or further detail? 
Yes, uh, we did have a question about uh, exporting thoughts with their note contents. Uh, ah, yes. Cover how to do that. Absolutely. Um, from time to time, and we do hear this quite a bit, particularly from uh, people that are using the brain for educational purposes. Uh, they're mapping out their course or they're doing their thesis in the brain and they need to submit an outline of their information to their publisher or uh, to their, their teacher, whatever the case may be, who might not be using the brain. So we do have many different export capabilities and to do that, I'm actually going to jump back over to the Shakespeare brain and let's say we just go into tragedies. So I'll go over to the tragedies. And there are a couple of different ways that you can do, uh, do the exports of your brain. Um, but, but specifically talking about exporting the brain with the notes, as the question came in, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to capture all of the thoughts that I'm interested in. So let's say I'm interested in my tragedies. I control I control click on tragedy to add it to the brain's selection box. I'm on a PC today, so that's done with a control click. If you're on a Mac, that's simply a command click to add an individual thought into your selection box. Now I can go down and meticulously say, well, I want Julius Caesar, Hamlet, Cornelius, and Macbeth. So again, control clicking, adding them into the selection box. I can also control click on a gate and notice that quickly adds that cluster, that group of thoughts into the selection box. Additionally, with tragedy as the current active thought, I can right click in the selection box and, sit and go down to crawl brain. So now I'm crawling through the brain and I'm saying, all right, all thoughts, child word for, I don't want to go too deep here because I've got a lot of different character studies, but this isn't too bad, two generations away from the current active thought, tragedy and I'll add those. So those are all of the different characters that I've added. So now let's go ahead and export that content. We've basically captured or, or moved over into the selection box a branch of thoughts within the brain. And now I'm going to right click and I can select just copy thoughts. Uh, if I want to copy these thoughts and paste them into another brain to share with others. But this question came up, copy an outline with the notes. And there's that feature right there, copy outline with notes. So I'll copy that content, and I'm just going to open up Notepad, so something really basic. Obviously, you can open up Word and to do some further editing and make thoughts bold and notes in it italic, etc. But Notepad will give you the idea. I'm going to right-click and select Paste, and here are, I've got quite a bit of notes. So here, let's just scroll through. There's Timon of Athens, if you're familiar with that tragedy. So Timon of Athens, and here are the notes down below. I've got quite a lot of notes. But look at this note up here. I can tell by the characters, Mer Mercutio, uh, Juliet, Beno uh, Romeo, Tybalt. Those are the houses of Romeo and Juliet, the Mont uh, Montagues and the Capulets. So there's Romeo and Juliet, a thought. Here's the note. And here are the child thoughts down below. And if those lined up, if it was a smaller note, you would, you would see that it is in outline form. So we've got the parent thought up above, then child thoughts, then child thoughts of those, et cetera, in outline form. All the notes all there. I selected an area with a lot of notes. So it might look like uh, it's quite a bit of content. It is quite a bit of content. But very quickly uh, pasted into a nice outline format that I can go through and uh, further refine, so I can make my notes stand out, or, or uh, you know, like I said, put those in italics, or whatever, you, what have you, clean that up further in another word processing tool. But that definitely is an option to do those exports out of the brain. Great. And uh, Diana had uh, the the famous question of is multiple brains better or is a single brain uh, better or, or which which do people usually prefer? Sure, sure. It is a famous question because uh, we get that quite a bit and there are two schools of thoughts. There's one brain for it all and there's topic specific brains. And you speak to two different people, you might get two different answers. There's no right or wrong. I really, really do like topic-specific brains. I keep brains for my personal hobbies and interests, 
My Shakespeare brain, I like it to be just about Shakespeare, the reason being so I can share that with other people. Of course, I have other hobbies and interests. I like woodworking. I like traveling. I like doing things with my kids, my family, and museums. That's in another brain. Shakespeare is in a brain all by itself. I keep it separate. That being said, I know some people, some of them might be on the phone with us right now that have one very powerful brain. They do one search. They're searching across their personal interests as well as business relations and, and information. Uh, one brain over the years. It's a massive brain, and it's still very fluid, very easy to use. The search happens fast. The navigation happens fast. And uh, Shelly, maybe you would like to speak to that point. Sure, yeah. Just to add to that, uh, I just want to make sure I'm not on. Am I on mute? No. You can hear me, right? No. No, we can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, I think when one brain or multiple brain, you are activate, activating a number of thoughts concurrently. So, for instance, I do have the mega brain, the Shelly Haydock, the one brain for it all. And I've got all my business and my life projects, too. But that is because throughout the day, I will be activating clients. I might jump back over to a renovation project. So that one big brain is just fabulous for everything. Um, another brain, and so you use the instant search to just quickly activate from one uh, thought to another. So just ask yourself, first of all, am I going to be juggling multiple projects? If so, I may not want a specific brain for each project. I might want them in a complete brain. And then uh, likewise, if I'm sharing, for instance, even though my mega brain actually isn't the writer's brain, that's a topic-oriented brain. So if I know I'm going to be sharing a brain with people or publishing it online, I just sort of want to give them a focused or streamlined view of that content, that's when I would create the topic-oriented brain. So what I do is I have my main brain with my name, and that's very common for brain users, my master brain, Shelly Haddock, which does, it is the largest brain that I personally created. And then I have my topic brains. And, uh, you know, a lot of people do that. I know Harlan Hugh does that as well. And Jerry Mikulski, I guess, is on record for the largest brain. He's almost at 400,000 thoughts now. And actually, um, somebody, oh, uh, Doug just wrote in about if there is a public list of brains. And yes, Patrick, just so everyone can see that answer, it's webbrain.com forward slash explore. You can also get to that area from our community page. We can tweet that out. There you'll see Jerry's brain. You can also access my writer's brain. Matt's brain is published there as well. Or if you guys just want the links to even just those three brains, um, what I'll actually probably include them in our thank you note that you'll be emailed. But feel free to just reply to your GoToMeeting uh, invite, and I'm, we're happy to share those links to you. Um, we're probably going to be doing a lot more with uh, Public Brains and uh, WebBrain.com uh, with the next release of the software. Right now, we're sort of in transition, but it is available to for people to to look at all kinds of brains there. And then I guess there's one more question from Stephanie. I see here about um, after this webinar when we. Uh, where would you suggest is the best place to really learn more on how to uh, learn the multiple brain software functions? So, and Patrick uh, wrote back about our tutorial page. So, Matt, you can pull that up. That is a great place. And then also, I want to point out tomorrow uh, we have the Brain 101, and that's hosted every uh, Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time by Matt. And we didn't start creating a brain from scratch because we were just covering sort of the conceptual aspects of the brain as it relates to creativity and writing. Um, but that particular class, every Friday, a brain is a new brain is created from ground up, and that's very helpful for uh, existing users and particularly new users because it's also smaller class size. So we'll get to. Um, more of uh, your questions and uh, just it covers more functionality like how to add thought types and tags or how to drag and drop documents like so just very basic functionality so I highly recommend that class for anyone who maybe hopped on today and loves the brain but still uh, not quite sure how to get started on your writer's brain so sign up for that on our home page and uh, that's uh, the brain 101 class every Friday and then back to the um, question about big brain, uh, Diana asked, does a big brain get slow? 
Um, so the answer to that question is actually no, it doesn't unless you know you're you're attaching, I guess, large images or files that your computer can't handle. But one of the things that is unique about the brain as opposed to uh, a mind map is that we are infinitely scalable. That's why we do have brains with thousands of items. And every time you click on a thought, it's going to trigger all related pieces of information. So um, in terms of software scalability, there really is no limit to the number of thoughts you can create uh, where you might get into issues, as I say, is if you're attaching large documents. And that would just be a matter of like when your computer has to retrieve them to click on them. But no, in terms of a big brain, what my brain, whether a 2,000 thought brain will navigate as quick as a, you know, 20 thought brain as well. So that, that don't let the, uh, you know, anything as far as uh, speed or functionality of the software impede you for creating that big brain. And Matt, I don't know if you have anything more to add. I know that we, I don't know, we're kind of on the end of our time here, but we could show, our, I guess, the import options. The other thing that's nice is if you create a smaller brain and you want to merge Absolutely. them all together, you can merge brains. And then conversely, I'm in the opposite situation where I have this ginormous brain. A lot of times I want to share things with people that aren't part of my team brain. So I, I actually just want to create satellite brains where I'll copy a branch of uh, one brain into another um, so those are features that will help you sort of have your cake and eat it too, if you will. So if you started with a large brain and you want to make it smaller, you can do that. And if you have a bunch of small brains, you want to create that one mega brain, you can do that as well. And there, it's important to point out too, there's other mind mapping tools out there that people sometimes compare to the brain, but they've got finite number of, of nodes, we call them thoughts, finite numbers of nodes that you can create. So your your mind map can only get so big and it's time to start building on to a, another topic. Like you get out to a particular branch of the mind map and you can't go any further. Um, so with that, you can import those into the brain and once again, no limits. Uh, create as many different new thoughts and links to other thoughts as you'd like. And um, of course, we could spend an entire webinar on all the different import capabilities. But if you go to file and scroll down to import, um, you can actually import a folder. So if you've got an existing folder on the book that you're writing or the content that you're researching, import that folder right into the brain. Every individual folder becomes a thought and the content, uh, files and documents inside each individual folder uh, show up as attachments. And then you can start mapping out how they're related to one another uh, again, once it gets into the brain. So we've got many different import capabilities for you, as well as exporting the brain out into either outlines or actually XML content, a much more advanced feature of the application, but that export to XML is possible as well. All right, Matt, and I don't know, I, I maybe Patrick covered this earlier, but we do get have multiple people asking how to find your brain. So maybe we can even tweet your brain and link to yours and mine out of the brain account, and we'll definitely include that again. And I don't know if you have a, a link you want to pull up on your screen now, or if, if you guys already covered that, I we apologize. Do, we do, do. That I want to show everyone, yeah, that you can go into, uh, just go to www.thebrain.com, and under the support area, you can see where you can get into application videos and templates. So these are different topics that we've done before. Today is all about creativity. Other days were all about getting things done or file management or people and project management, etc. So there's a lot of different topics. You can watch a full hour webinar on the brain being used for that topic. And then, of course, access a brain. So you can download a sample brain in some cases or navigate through that brain online. And if you scroll down, you can see writing and creative projects is there. That's what we're talking about today. So here is a previous recording. We'll update this with today's recording. And again, send you the link. And down below, quick and easy access to see Shelley's writing brain, to see my Shakespeare brain, and uh, actually access those and browse through them online. All right, great. And then uh, Diana had a question about folder imports. Does importing destroy or remove the folders in the original location? And the answer is no. It actually just copies that folder. Um, that's something we also that's covered right. in our file management uh, webinar. But uh, yeah, feel free to do an import of a folder or you know of a, of a mind and mind map from another software. We do have various uh, importing options. 
And I think with that, I want to make sure um, we've covered most of the questions, but I'm going to let, oh, it looks like we have the timeline question. I'm just going to have Patrick jump in because I want to make sure uh, I don't get redundant. But somebody had a question about how we do timelines in the brain. Um, so of course you can do timelines sure. by numerating thought, but we also have that little clock right by the search which will track um, your brains in a, your thoughts in a time-based way. So if we want to cover timeline real quick as well. Absolutely. Sometimes it's really important to know, you know, what was that thought that I was working on just the other day or somebody sent me something, I dropped it into the brain, but I didn't have time to look at it. I can't remember what that PDF was even called or about. How am I going to find that in a 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 thought brain? It's lost. Not at all. There are many, many different ways that you can navigate and search through your brain. This is a very simple one. You simply click on the clock right next to the search. So if you know the thought name or the content that you're searching for, the brain automatically indexes text-based content without you having to tell it to do that. So if you know that there's a sentence in, in this document about a public beta release on Thursday, simply type those keywords in and you'll find the document you're looking for. Or you can click on the uh, little image of the clock here. And so these are thoughts that I actually modified today. And I can scroll back through time and it, it's, it's going uh, um, on and on through time about when I added different content. So there it's already scrolling down all the way down into 2013, 2012, 2011 when content was added into this brain. So on a very, very active brain, you can really get an idea, an overview of day to day what type of content is going into your brain. You can also jump down into reports. So reports can help you further uh, sort of calculate or find information in a very specific structured way. If I just refresh, this is an alphabetical listing of all thoughts in this particular brain. But if I'm saying, all right, I want to find all thoughts activated within the past week or the past month, there's only 43 of those thoughts or all thoughts that contain an attachment of a particular type. So once again, this is a whole other area, a feature of the brain that we can spend a great deal of time on. But I do want to let you know and be aware that it's a possibility to say, all right, all thoughts that have at least one attachment that have been modified in uh, the past, what is today, January, let's say in the past week. And so there's all thoughts with at least one attachment that have been modified within the past week. And I can now, rather than going through 3,000 thoughts to find that PDF document, I only have five or in this case six different thoughts to take a look at. And this brain doesn't have PDFs, but if it did, I could filter by PDFs as well. So that's another option in thoughts by attachment. It'll only show you here the thought types that exist in your brain. So look in your own brain and you'll see there's PDFs, there's PowerPoints, there's Word documents. Whatever your document types are, you can find all of those thoughts that have that particular attachment, whether it's an internal attachment, shortcut, etc. So a lot of different filtering that you can do in the reports area as well. And that's great because especially writers, you're dealing with so many different files, usually documents and presentations, and that's why the ability to do um, versioning on thoughts and document management, um, you know, we sort of covered the, the cool, uh, you know, all the, the neat con connections, but just the brain for document management, for the, keeping track of those versions and linking all those files is a, a pretty powerful application. So I'm um, glad that you showed that reporting capability so that you can actually go in and look at, look for specific attachments by date, time range, uh, thought type, all that kind of thing too. So that's a, that's a very nice data management capability as well. And I think with that, we've covered everything. I don't know, Patrick, if you see anything else. Um, it, it, we've, we've covered a lot of ground in today's session and we are in overtime. So I guess we're going to probably end the webinar, but before I do, Matt, any other final um, words of wisdom or anything else that you want to share with, with everyone today? Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, it's uh, really fun for us to show um, a, a more creative aspect of the application using the brain, not only for data and file management, but for your own personal interests. 
and uh, and activities. So uh, many, many uh, different possibilities of using the brain. So thanks again for joining us. And as Shelly mentioned, Brain 101 tomorrow. If you're just getting started, it's a great way to get an introduction from the ground up with the brain. All right, great. And then one final question somebody's asking about how secure the documents are in the cloud. We do use RSA mm. encryption on all attachments and everything is, is very secure. Uh, we can send you more security information and completely private. So um, just note that uh, your brain, unless you do want to offer it up for public consumption or, or share it with another team member, um, is uh, secure and it's private and it's also a great backup tool in case you spill water on your laptop or you're transferring data between machines. You might be working uh, at home on your Mac and at work on a PC. Um, you might have another iPad so accessing all the information across multiple devices. So the cloud, in addition to a, a very strong publishing vehicle for writers, is just a great, again, another data accessibility tool. So I just, uh, A Relief just wrote in about uh, security of the cloud. So I just had to get that one last question answered. And I think with that, we're going to end today's session. So I want to wish you well on whether you're creating the next Shakespeare sonnet or just writing a uh, your, your next uh, company brochure or whatever you're doing. Um, hopefully, you'll see the power of visual connections and be able to uh, do it just a little better by using the brain. And uh, hope to see you again on, on future brain technology events. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.